Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content out on the internet. Go to focuscompounding.com to do exactly that. You can get access to free investment write-ups uh, from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. There is no other archive on the internet, probably outside of Buffett, that has more written words on investing than what we have on focuscompounding.com. You can get access to it all for free. Just go to the URL and grab a cup of coffee and have fun sipping through years of write-ups. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, reach out to me at androidfocuscompound.com or go to that Invest With Us tab on our website to get more information on that. So in today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to talk about what exactly does Alice Schroeder mean when she says that Buffett cares about macro. Value investors are trained, um, it seems like, to say they don't follow macro, they don't think about macro. Buffett says that actually often in public. Um, but I do think he thinks about it differently than what a traditional macro investor would be thinking about. Is he thinking about speculating on currencies or interest rates? No, but he does pay attention uh, to all of the relevant data. And you and I uh, were talking about this, how there's an interview that she has when she uh, was tell she told a story about, she told Buffett that she purchased a home in like 2007 and Buffett was basically aghast. He couldn't believe it. And I guess uh, from my memory, he sort of looked up for a second and said, well, you'll probably break money in 10 years. And she had said that he was correct about that. It took about 10 years for the value of her home to uh, come back from being underwater. Um, so, you know, he definitely does pay attention to all this. He has all of this data that comes through Berkshire. Uh, I was looking through a Buffett archive that we have, uh, which I've tweeted out before, but basically it's everything that Buffett has ever said publicly or written uh, publicly all in one compiled uh, file, not everything, but basically everything that's in the public domain and everything uh, from his, um, uh, the meetings, uh, so the letters, writings, annual report, and the uh, transcripts from the meetings. And it's all compiled in one place. And I did a control F of macro. And every single time he was talking about macro in general, he basically said that they don't pay attention to it and they never have made a investment decision or not made an investment decision uh, based on some sort of macro information. They fully focus on uh, the business itself. Um, but what's interesting is, and I have this from a different interview that Alice did with somebody, and he basically asked her the same question. He said, many value investors follow this lead of avoiding all macroeconomics, whether it's risk, et cetera. Tell us about the way Buffett looks at the economy as a whole. How does he factor that into his database and decisions? And she said, Buffett is keenly aware of the economic cycle and relevant data. He uses economic data to put context around what is happening in specific businesses, meaning that it lets him visualize macro risks at the company specific level. Second, macro data signals to Buffett where Mr. Market is going awry. For example, what parts of the stock market might be fertile digging grounds? So I wanted to get your thoughts on what Buffett means or what Alice Schroeder means when she talks about how Buffett does focus on macro. I talk about this idea of just grassroots economics, understanding different um, you know, industries, supply and demand dynamics, the capital cycles uh, to really find these, what you would call fertile hunting grounds. Uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know, what you think Alice Schroeder means and how Buffett thinks about macro. I think the comment about macro as context is important. Um, when looking at individual stocks, the big thing that happens with value investors is they feel that um, the current PE level or the current EV to EBITDA, you know, if you're using like value investors club type talk, um, is really important. And that things like the price to book of something or those valuation metrics uh, matter the same throughout a cycle, right? 
And most of the time they do. Uh, probably for two-thirds of all industries you could think of right now and two-thirds of times within any industry, that works fine. But there'll be a little tail on each side of things when things are really, really bad in an industry or really, really good, and it's important to be aware of that. Um, and you could call that macro or you could call that specific to that industry. Sometimes it is very macro-related. There's a company, a uh, U.S. company, listed in the U.K., um, called Samero Industries. And it makes um, machines for flattening stuff. Basically, you want to build like a Costco or something. You want the floors to be completely flat. Um, you would use a company like this. That's the easiest way to explain what they do. Um, that is one of the most economically sensitive things you can think of. So why would the stock be down a lot? There could be a few reasons, but the most likely reason is that the market understands that after 2007, 2008, it took seven or eight years for the company to get back to where it was before in terms of, say, sales or something. And uh, real sales probably didn't even quite get back there. And uh, that it makes very high returns on capital, right? So it makes returns on capital at this point in the cycle that make it look like a great business. But at that other part of the cycle... Um, its returns on capital are under the amount needed. So if you look there, even at the first few years of the 2000s, what was its RIC? So 2006, 0%, 13%, 4%, and then negative okay. 40%. Right. And so it really has only been the last 10 years or so that has put together more than one year in a row of returns on capital that would justify a book value above one. Now, the returns are very, very high. And it's a judgment call, but I would say that what happened in the financial crisis would affect demand for the kinds of things that they do. Um, as more than anything, it's, it's a once in every 50 years at most event. Maybe this kind of thing happened in the 30s, probably did. Um, maybe it would happen in the 70s, but probably not as strong as what happened in uh, 2008. So it's something that might happen three times in 100 years. Um, so once every 30-year event, once every 50, whatever. Uh, if you're willing to hold it over a full cycle, it might be fine, and it might be fine to buy it even at these points, understanding things might get worse. And um, the the when they do, it could be really bad for a really long time. It's the same thing we talked about with title insurance or I talked about with Hunter Douglas. You know, Hunter Douglas didn't have a big change in terms of its market um, power, its market share and stuff over a long period of time. However, it was vertically integrated and there was a big drop off just in the amount of volume of window covering stuff because people just weren't moving from place to place for years. And so it took, you know, there just wasn't sufficient volumes in the industry for five or six years to get people to the point where they could make money. So the thing is you don't want to buy that now. You know, Graham said uh, you don't want to buy into something assuming that that price is normal. So you can look at Samara and say, okay, seven times earnings or, or, you know, four times EBITDA or something. But what you probably want to say is, well, do I like it at eight or nine? Because this could be 50%. This could be, you know, 50% lower than this could be the norm. Um, it's the same thing when we talked about the COVID boom things. So you need to understand what could cause that and not just ignore it. Um, you're a human being, not a not a, a computer. You don't need to be so um, blind to obvious things about the context. Mm -hmm. Now, the macro thing I think is different. We'll use another example here, which I think is more what we say when we say a macro investor. We'll use Vera Bradley. So this is what I would think of as if you have a macro view, a stock that you buy. So Vera Bradley on like some arrows up a ton. So if you put the two stocks together over the last year or something, Samara would be like down all this way. Vera would be up all this way. Why? Why is that happening? If anything, I think Samara's had better results by far reporting than Vera Bradley. We brought up Vera Bradley before. It was nearly a net net. It was incredibly cheap versus things like sales and stuff. So why would this be happening? It's possible that's in the results, but I've read the results and they're not very good. Um, so it's unlikely to be the results or even much of the guidance directly. What's very possible is that it makes women's handbags and uh, lower end compared to some of the others. So it was probably the one that and it sells in malls and stuff. So people probably the most 
wanting to bet on it if you uh, had a view that consumer discretionary was going to be better than people thought. So we had the soft landing thing happen, right? What stock would be like the best stock to buy if you have a soft landing Vera Bradley? Because it's dirt cheap and most things in that kind of category aren't. So you would buy the absolute cheapest thing in the category you have a strong feeling about. You know, so that's the macro thing of the shipbuilding things, the coal things, whatever. They find whatever thing is the cheapest in that, and they have a view that that's going to be better next year, and so that's why they buy it. Um, Buffett has done some pretty straight-up macro things, though. He did speculate on currencies um, against the U.S. dollar. He speculated in silver, um, buying up a large part of the world supply of silver that way. Um, so he's done both of those things. Um and you know, but we're talking about things twenty years ago, and they didn't move the needle that much. And then oil, to a certain extent, is that same sort of macro bet. Um, so I think, you know, there are times where he's done it. I don't think it's worked out that well necessarily. Um, and he commented a lot on it in the early letters in terms of the industry dynamics. Um, not not just um, long term like he does now, but even year to year, having opinions about what the insurance market would look like next year and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say is that macro or not? Like you know, I was reading a write up that was very positive on one insurance company, not on another, and it actually got me interested in looking at the one they were negative on because the insurance market they were writing about has hardened quite a bit, as a lot of them have. And um, the company was saying our prices are going to be a lot higher in the future. And what was interesting about it, and they didn't like this company because it wasn't growing this number of policies and stuff the way that the other one was. But what was interesting about that is um, the company had gone several years with like similar premiums, but making more money each year previously in the cycle. And then it really dropped down when things got bad. Um, but so it showed a lot of res restraint in terms of them being willing to change the amount of volume that they would write and stuff. So once they were willing to write a large amount of volume, it meant that they were positive on uh, what the insurance market looked like. So I don't know if you call that macro. People think the insurance market kind of is a separate sort of thing. But then if I say that about CarMart or about a bank, then people view that as, as macro, right? Because it includes interest rates, includes financial conditions more generally. But it's important to understand those contexts to not be fooled. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, when I bought stock in FICO and Omnicom, one thing that gets overlooked when I mention those is because they don't make a big point of it. The multiples were not just low enough multiples, but they're low multiples on the lowest point in the cycle. You knew that credit and advertising were at their worst part of the cycle. You didn't know if they were going to get a lot better, but you knew they dropped off a lot. It would be different if you were betting on low multiples in 2006-2007 for a credit business, right? But if you're doing it in let's say 2010 for instance, by then people, you know, who knows when 2009 and 2008 things are still going on, but by 2010 people know that the economy is in bad shape and there's not a lot of credit applications for stuff and new loans and things being made. So you would know that if you can get it at a reasonable multiple, then it's a reasonable multiple and it's not a peak multiple, um, which is the thing that you want to avoid. You want to really avoid periods where it peaks. And that's where you get really badly hurt in some things um, that people pay peak multiples for peak earnings. So in the beginning of the pod, you had said paying attention to like the industry and whether it's really good or really bad from like a macro perspective. What did you mean by that? Well, the context, right? So what is the situation in the industry now? The There'll be times, uh, Buffett's investing in companies, Berkshire Hathaway is a really good example of the textile mill. I think it's important to like look at what the history of that company was. So read Jacob McDonough's book, um, Capital Allocation, New England Textile Mill, you know, whatever years it is, 1950-something to 80-something. Um, so I think people have the impression that that business is like um, something that earns a very low return year after year after year. But that's not what was happening in that business. What happened is that it was a structurally disadvantaged business versus Japan, which I think Jacob talks about in that book, and certainly versus the southern United States. 
basically they were able to air condition things and get reasonable power costs and stuff in the southern United States when they hadn't before. And they, so that's why the business has always been in the north. So there was no reason for the mills to be in the north anymore. It made more sense to have them in the south. And it certainly made more sense to have them. Uh, you had cheaper labor in Asia. I don't know if it made more sense, but for some of the business, it might have made more sense. So um, they still had good years. You know, um, the there was still reallocation is what the genius was. Yeah, the capital reallocation, but there would be occasional years where textiles make a lot of money. It was not the case that textiles textiles are a cyclical business, so they would lose a little money a lot of the time, and then they would make a bunch of money for a year or two. Um, they had a cycle like a semiconductor type cycle, so it would not be like um, a company that has low returns all the time. So sometimes people talk about a company that has you know three or four percent returns or something all the time. And but has it very very consistently. Uh, those aren't as bad sometimes in the long run if you buy them really really cheap. The Berkshire one's trickier because it poses a real problem that someone could have bought it in a year where it was having a good year for textiles, and that's what Buffett means with the net nets thing, where he says there'll be some hiccup that lets you sell it. Something will happen, right? We we looked at literal net nets where this did happen and the stock price went up. Friedman Industries have been a net net for a long time, many times in its history, spiked. Um, we talked about Jewett Cameron with COVID versus you know what happened during COVID versus what happened now. Jewett Cameron was often a net net. There are these things that happen and they post strong earnings on them for a brief period. Um, see, and it's not the only time. Yeah, so you have the chart of Friedman Industries up there. And as you can see, it's not the only time that it's spiked like that. It's actually had several spikes. Like, it's not dead money. If you own this stock for... If, if you were smart enough to know when was a really bad time for the company, right? Like, you knew when it was losing money and you knew when it was cheap. And you held for five years. Every time you got a better, much better price within five... Like, you could have done well in the stock if you just were willing to hold for five years and you knew enough to buy at a bad time. Now, the problem is this is not a stock you want to buy and hold, Right? Because there's now been several times over the last decades where if you happen to buy when earnings were really good, when the business was doing really well, uh, and hold it, you'd be in the same place a decade later or longer, 15 years later. Why is it that this company consistently becomes a net-net? So you talk about the macro aspect of it. Is it the yeah. price of space on the price of steel and, and the, the cycle that revolves around that? Yeah, so it's inventory. So a lot of people don't like to buy net nets that have a lot of inventory. However, net nets with a lot of inventory are the ones that are going to have this happen to them. And Berkshire Hathaway had a lot of inventory. So what's happening, why... Um, so on a liquidation basis, people are absolutely right. Cash receivables are best, right? But on an inventory basis, this is a bet inside the industry. So their inventory is just steel. Um, and a lot of it, huge amounts. I mean, we could look at the balance sheet now. Uh, but even now where it's at a higher price than it used to be, it has a very large component of the inventory on a, um, not a net basis, but like just if we look at quarterly um, at inventory overall, um, do we have, let's see. So what is their inventory listed at? 101 right million. Okay. And then let's look at their market cap. 108 million. Mm -hmm. So they have an inventory of steel. Steel moves around a lot in price. What's a great way to speculate on steel? You can go to commodity things and try to speculate in all sorts of stuff, or you could buy Friedman Industries. Mm -hmm. Because it is interesting if you look at like the correlation. So the purple is the price of steel, and then the blue is Friedman Industries. And whenever the price of steel goes up, you could see that the, the price does jump and then it comes down. And that's kind of mm -hmm. interesting to look at. Yeah. And so the question is just am I getting a really good bargain? Um, it's also important with this stuff to understand. Uh, this is a good thing to relate to something I always complain about with junk bond stuff. REITs fall in the same category, but junk bonds, definitely. Um, and stock market returns long-term, too. People will quote these things from the past without context of what it looks like right now. So you'll sometimes get people say, well, in the early 80s or the late 70s or something, or twice in the, late seven, in the early 70s, but then when they're talking about it, they're really talking about the early 80s, junk bonds did okay when you really think about it. They didn't do as badly as you would expect. Um, what their returns are in some terrible recession. But that was a situation in which they had high yields, right? 
all that would matter is what were the default rates that they had and what were the recoveries um, when comparing it to today, right? Of course they did well if they had like a shorter duration and a high yield and everything as compared to things that had a long duration and, and um, low yield. People are comparing it to like what if rates go up a lot. The, the same thing here. Friedman Industries, we just talked about. One thing that can become a problem for people with the macro, that's the wrong way to use it, right? Is um, you just said, look at the relationship between steel and Friedman Industries. Great point. But what will happen is Friedman Industries will double at some point relative to inventory. And people will say, I want to speculate on steel by buying Friedman Industries. Well, now it's at a higher price, but they're going to say, they're not going to take that into account. They're just going to say these two things move together, right? Mm -hmm. What you want is the reverse. These usually move together when do i want to buy freeman industries when it's really cheap mm -hmm. right um and the other reason for doing it which is the macro point which is the thing about like buffett with oil or something what's the other advantage when working through stocks for some of this stuff is that if the business is fairly safe um in terms of its balance sheet it hasn't borrowed a lot it has some cash has some receivables whatever um, it can be a longer term speculation that's safe than trying to do it through some other method using futures and options and things with stocks. I mean, that that's the thing that people overlook sometimes is like the, the shortness of the time period can be risky. Mm -hmm. Um, you could do it and people have done it like, you know, um, uh, Peter Kundal in the, um, there's always something to do. You know, they talk a little bit about the Japan shorts, but he has to keep keep putting them on the Nikkei shorts, you know, and a lot of times people will eventually give up doing that, whereas they're much more likely to buy a stock and stay in it. Mm -hmm. So the advantage that you have is that if you have this speculation, you can buy the stock and stay in it. Um, I, if you have this view that uranium is going to be in short supply in the future, right? I do. If, if you had that view... Buying a safe enough so that it's durable, uranium stock and holding it for the long term may be a way to, to do that from a, a macro bet that you're more likely to actually carry out over the longer term. The same way with Buffett with his um, currency things, you know, right? It's actually easier on the currency things if you probably buy stocks. Let's say you think the U.S. dollar is going to go down. It's, you can do it through currency things. But the other thing to consider is, well, maybe I just will put a lot of my portfolio in cheap Japanese stocks that I like or cheap whatever stocks and not hedge it. It's like, how do you express that view is what you're basically talking about? Because, OK, so let's say you think oil prices are going to go higher. Are oil, is oil going to go from, you know, 100 bucks to 200 bucks? I don't know, maybe, but probably not. But can you find a company that can be a two, three, four, five bagger if oil stays at 80, 90, 100? Mm hmm. It's how do you find that view to express it with that torque, but also, um, you know, buying something that's cheap. It's a great business. I'm with you. And I, I do think the best returns do come from when you have that macro uh, tailwind behind you, not macro in the sense of like interest rates and stuff like that, but more so like industry dynamics and, and stuff like that, stuff that's relevant to the industry, the company, et cetera. Yeah. And so I think it's context that way. It. We don't know in the future if the market will correctly price it in, underprice it, overprice it, whatever. But it's always something to keep in mind to be careful about because there does exist the potential, whether it's quant things, AI things, just the way people behave or whatever, that they won't realize that they're buying things that look cheap but actually aren't. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, AMARC Precious Metals, right? We talked about AMARC Precious Metals, wrote it up and said, look, most of the value at the time, I forget the stock was at ten dollars or something. Close, but most of the value at the time was it okay? It's um, cheap. was eighty percent or something of the value is investment value back then. It was reasonable to expect that you could take a speculation. So the question was, do you want an intelligent speculation, a cheap speculation, whatever it might be? Um, basically said the same thing with Vitess, right? VTS. Um, you know, look, you're not really paying anything to take a speculation on oil. If you want to speculate on oil, um, now a particular place that they're getting the oil from, it's not diversified by state. You're basically getting from one place and everything. Um, but, and it's mostly oil, you know, some gas, but it's weighed more to oil. So it's very much a speculation on one thing. Um, if you want to do that, 
you're not really paying a lot. And then they guess you're not paying like anything above that, just to take that speculation. With A Mark Precious Metals, the thing is, see that part where it's flat there. And this is not unique. This thing was written up on Value Investors Club, some other places, people noticing exactly the same thing point that I was making, which is um in periods of very, very low volatility in physical metals, gold and silver, um, the company was starting to be priced off of that. As if that period that you see that's very flat would stay forever. However, that was an abnormally low volatility period. Now, no one could have predicted, well, COVID's going to happen. It's going to go crazy. Um, there's going to be COVID. There's going to be political unrest. There's going to be all sorts of things, right? It's the same like you couldn't predict. That's also a reason why gun sales spiked, presumably, is because of those sorts of things, too. You couldn't predict that ahead of time. But you can see, well, our gun sales lower than they normally are? Is the volatility here really, really low? And the same thing if I was looking at, you know, because I compared AMR precious metals to like an investment bank, basically. And if there's years where an investment bank would, you know, say there's no volatility, say there's not a lot of capital out there to take things public and stuff, they're not going to do well. Um, there's not much, all the things that their business does is not going to work here. And AMR Precious Metals, most of it was investment that you could do. And then a little bit I said is there's a little bit of speculation in here though. That this stock is not cheap at this price. You're you got to pay a premium of twenty twenty five percent whatever to take a flyer on it, which some people did. And if they did, then it went up. What did we just say? Three times, seven times, whatever. Um, so, if you wanted to say, I, I, it was better than doing gold. Let me put it that way. Vitesse is better than buying oil. Amar Precious Metals was better than buying gold. Um. I mean, gold has like a negative carry and stuff. I mean, there's all sorts of things that would be bad about gold um, as compared to AMARC, which to a value investor even didn't seem like, well, you're paying almost nothing for the fact that, that you could have this. Now, do you want that? Do you need that? I don't know. But it's there. And then there's other cases where it's not. You know, let's say Alico, right? Lately, the orange crop has been terrible. They had a hurricane and everything. Have you seen the prices of orange shoes lately? To pull that up for you. It's gone crazy. Okay. It's gone absolutely crazy. Nope. Okay. Well, they get about 50% of it. They're, they're, it's about shared 50 50 with the Tropicana. So, the problem with this company is obviously that the amount of oranges has gone down all the time. They have a citrus greening issue and they've had some weather issues and stuff. Um, this is obviously one if you wanted to speculate on Florida land, right? Because they still own some ranch land in addition to the citrus land. But, um, Obviously, it could be liquidated one day that if you really couldn't make money in citrus, you could sell it for another purpose. And you could certainly sell... They will sell the ranch land, I assume, over time. I don't think they have any plans to do anything else with that. Um, the problem is how expensive is it? This is the same thing where we talk about Maui land and pineapple and stuff. If there's no return in it and everything um, while you own it from the operating business, which is pretty close to what's been the situation with Alico, yeah. So orange juice is up a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are we at on it? So we're $333 year to date. Okay. It's up 68% six, over the past year. Yeah. Yeah. What I, I do compare when you think about it too, right? Like you think about oil being in less supply or like steel at times. I mean, orange juice though, if orange juice gets pretty high, I mean, don't people just stop drinking orange juice? I don't know if that's no, as so much as a necessity like oil would be and getting around and stuff like that. You know, from the demand destruction side. So it's interesting. So so obviously orange juice, you know, by volume and definitely by weight is uh, more expensive than gasoline, right? So even though in people's minds, gasoline is the big thing, of, of course. So um, let's say that at retail or something, it's $9 a gallon or something versus three something for, for gas. Um, so it, it, the thing with orange juice that worries me a little, with oranges that worries me a little bit Um is that you have possible production from other places, right? And at some point you get used to that and get supplying from that. Uh, so people who drink oranges can get it from a bunch of different places. Um, you can get it from California. California advertises. California is bad for orange juice. It tastes bad. They can blend some of it into other things and it's okay, but... But for some reason, California has a very positive image, and it's a thing they can sell on and stuff. So you have a little bit of specialty stuff that seems to focus on California. But California is not a good place to get oranges from. But 
Florida is, Brazil is, um, those are your main, that make up a lot of it. Uh, and then there are other political things that worry me about it over time too. So if the industry keeps shrinking in terms of what it's outputting and stuff, um, then you're going to have a problem uh, with the protections for the industry and stuff. Before, there was such a big industry in an important state, Florida, right? Um, that it's kind of like the ethanol effect with Iowa, right? You need Everyone wants to win the Iowa primary and stuff, so, caucus, so um, you all have to support ethanol, right? Because um, they grow corn there that gets turned into ethanol. Um, when Florida was important that way for oranges, then you, you would feel a little bit more protected against things like Brazil. Um, so... But I, I think the the thing to be careful about then is what are you paying? And and this is why like macro is only the context for it. Um, like you said, let's say you thought orange prices were going to go up a lot. The thing is, if you look, volumes have been down sometimes by such a large amount. And that's one of the reasons why I think the modeling of this stuff is very um, silly in the case of something like Alico. You look, people come up with these models, but Alico's ability to produce volume depends on things like the progress of a a citrus greening disease and stuff, like weather in their particular area and stuff. And um, the decisions to grow this, to plant the trees, have been made, you know, at least four years ago and sometimes more like eight years ago in terms of peak production. So volume can drop even though price is telling you produce more. And then other times volume could go up even though price is saying, you know, produce less. Um, so they're very, uh, it's very uneven that way. The mean reversion isn't going to be as strong as in some other industries where we, I'd feel more comfortable with that where I'm like, okay, well, they'll, yeah, if the price goes up a lot, then people will produce more and the price will come back down and, you like know, those you don't oil, worry that much. That right oil now. well online, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, my concern with Alco, though, is that the... Um, the the citrus business doesn't at this point justify so much of the investment case for it, so that's why you have a problem versus some of the others that we talked about. Um, if you're speculating on it, um, in this case, if you're speculating the land, is what I'm saying. If you want to speculate on the orange juice aspect of it, sure. I mean, because the liquidation value from the land, if it was used for different purposes, is probably fine. I mean, if they if they had enough time to do it and said, let's sell off all the citrus land, which um, is not likely, they're what? Um, I don't know. It would reduce U.S. orange juice production by like more than 10% or something if they decide to liquidate. So um, if they did that, then obviously, you know, uh, the, the they might be able to liquidate it, right? So if you're just speculating on the land, basically. But you have to look at it as one way or the other, right? Either you're buying it because you think the orange business is, the stock is only fully pricing in the orange business, or you think it's only fully pricing in a land business and you have some positive thoughts about what's going to happen with citrus stuff. Um, And that's where I think the context for a decision is important and where Buffett really makes that point. Um, It also is similar to like how Buffett thinks about price sometimes I think people will say like um, that he's willing to pay a full price and everything for a wonderful business and maybe he's done it um, especially with a business he's bought all of right precision cast parts was kind of a very full price or something but generally he doesn't he buys Apple at a lower price than people would consider a very full price for the company right he doesn't pay a multiple above the market normally and that's the same warning I'd have with all these macro things. The problem I see a lot is people expressing their macro views by just saying, well, I'll buy oil stocks or I'll buy silver or gold stocks or uranium stocks or orange, you know, citrus stuff because I have this view. Okay, but what's the price and what is it without that? What is it at constant levels? What is it if it liquidates? What is it? You know, Friedman Industries, if you want to speculate on steel, that's fine when Friedman Industries is a net net, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, because it's something really, really cheap. So what do you think, like, something like coal, right? So BTU, Peabody, Energy Corp, uh, from a industry perspective, on the supply side of things, there will probably never be another coal mill 
coal mine built in America. So limited in that sense. Right. But then you look at the valuation here. I mean, EV to free cash flow, one times PE, two, I mean, just screams very cheap. It uh, looks like they have net yeah. cash, $2.9 billion market cap, $2.1 billion EV. So going back to the last podcast, this would be a capital allocation story, right? In the sense of, okay, if they stay here, what do they do with all that free cash flow? Do they buy back stock? Do they dividend it out? Right. What do they do? Yes, it is a lot of that. Uh, it is also, though, you want to be careful because you want to look at the underlying factors as to why this is happening. Mm-hmm. Um the U.S., so there's two things. One, you've got energy stuff with coal for steam purposes, right, thermal. And then you've got your metallurgical for making steel, right? Mm-hmm. Two different kinds of businesses have different things with the trade around the world and everything for this. Uh, the only thing that we've invested in that as coal stuff is purely um, steam coal, and it's under long-term contracts and stuff. Um, the The U.S., Energy Information Agency, or whatever it's called, um, e- e- I- EIA, I- right, has detailed information for all of this stuff, like weekly, basically. Uh, so, for instance, it was possible to see that coal production, I'd say something like NACA or something, would go up at some point. Um, also, possible at one point that it would go down simply because they tracked the amount of inventories on site. And what was happening was that the amount of coal piled up at power plant sites, which are things like the mine mouth stuff with, with um, NACO and stuff, uh, got very low. So th- th- that means it's going to go up in price a lot. And uh, it's a shortage situation. You have to pay whatever because you can't shut down the plant and you can't switch over from one fuel source to another. So that's what you pay. Um, the situation though sometimes reverses itself, and that's why you want to watch inventories and stuff. Um, the the big thing is usually watching inventories. I mean, if all, you could boil down all the macro stuff, is if you could measure inventory stuff really well, that would be the one to focus on. Um, a lot of problems come from either sometimes you have. Uh, s- company data that tells you like what your results are and people focus too much on that and sometimes you have retail data which is good if you can get it um of the actual sell through and stuff but it's important to understand when you're reading these things what it means when it says bud light is down whatever percentage versus this brand because of this is that the actual sell through of it or is it the um shipments that the company is making to its um to distributors or to um, companies that sell it. The pricing stuff is going to happen because of inventory things. So like we owned a UK car dealer set ahead of time. Next year is going to be the best year ever for it. It's because inventory is worth nothing. So we know it's not hard to predict for houses, for cars. There's a certain amount that people need. And if there's no inventory for it, it's going to go up. Um, they can't really put it off all that much. Um, and the same thing where we talk about the semiconductor stuff. That's the thing that's hard about like NVIDIA. I don't know how much of it is tight supply. If too much of it is tight supply that there's no inventory, you can charge very, very high prices. Anything that has no inventory, you know, when you get down to an inventory of nothing in something, uh, it, it supports prices tremendously. And then when you get to an over inventory situation, you have the reverse, you know, which is what you could see obviously happened with, um, uh, you know, like Walmart and Target and stuff. There's other macro things that I don't think are as important, but can be predicted ahead of time. For instance, um, analyst estimates, right? So sometimes analyst estimates for things are likely somewhat illogical and um, in the sense that they don't, they're not internally uh, coherent, right? So a good example would be analysts have expectations for improving um, margins, at some companies, and declining inflation. Now, for most companies, this is not likely to happen. So if they mean, they might be expecting the inflation will come down entirely from like, if they're doing CPI stuff, maybe energy things and shelter or something, and everything else will be inflating. And then this works out fine. But most companies that you're going to have analysts covering are going to be using FIFO right? Instead of LIFO for inventory. So first in, first out, instead of last in, first out. Um, 
when you do that, it's important to keep in mind like these quirks of the macro things or whatever we talk about. Um, the cost of your sales was determined by the price at the time that you bought the product, not the later price. So if you take something that was the first thing you bought and now you're selling it, so you're going to say, okay, the first thing I bought is now coming out as the first thing I sold. There's a gap between those two. And whatever your price was was before is included in your cost of sales, not the price to replace it. And that's very important because it, people overlook that. It's the same thing that I get all the time with um, misunderstanding depreciation. People always say depreciation is to estimate the replacement cost, which it's not. Depreciation is to smooth out the purchase price. And that's significant because if you had high inflation, then your future actual cost is going to be much higher. So like we had inflation during COVID, earnings quality goes down, right? It's obvious that earnings quality goes down because to replace all of the things on your balance sheet is now 20% more than it was before or whatever, you know, money supply increase that wasn't expected. So you can keep those kinds of things in mind too and understand why that would cause kind of misses and things that we're talking about and either be worried about them or not be worried about them. Um, and there are companies in the same industries that report using different sorts of stuff on that, right? Um, and I don't see anything about it except that people just take what the company said. So for instance, if a company says, here's our LIFO thing, but if we had adjusted for the LIFO, this is what it'd be. They just take the better one that the company says it is and not worry about it. But you don't know the company told you on the other side that they benefited from it. you got to go back and check to see if it was included on both things, that they downgraded earnings on the other side and upgraded on this side. Um, so that's the kind of thing I think Buffett understands very well. And that's the macro aspect of it that helps add context. Mm -hmm. You know, Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding podcast. This is the first time you're tuning in. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to be notified whenever we upload a podcast or a video on YouTube. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, uh, reach out to me at Andrew at FocusedCompounding.com. I want to thank everyone so much for tuning in with the both of us, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.